<laughs> All right, great. Um, so uh, our application is, is usually like path planning, but PAD control can be really used for a lot of different things. But essentially, um, or I guess for, for path planning, like we're usually trying to control the car as it moves along a path. And so um, the way PID control works fundamentally is it measures the difference between um, the like robot's current path and the path that it should be following. So like in this example, we have a robot here and we have a obstacle and like it might want to just go straight, but really it should be following along this line. And so as the robot, if the robot just goes straight, then there's going to be an error between the, the current path and the path it should be following. Or in other words, an error between the, the variable that we're like trying to control and the target value for that variable. So we can use, so we use something called feedback control, which is a way of taking the, that error distance and then like feeding it back into our current control system. Um, uh, usually, like usually you call this type of system a plant where you take some input, in this case it'd be like the, the velocity or acceleration commands, maybe steering, um, and then pass it through like some plant that processes those values and gives an output for how the robot's actually gonna move. Um, and so what we wanna do is take our reference position, um, which, which really should be here in blue, um, and then we measure the error between those two. We pass it through our PID, and then this gives us a new value to give as input to our, our plant system. So in, in this case, what we want out of the PID is we want it to tell us to move closer to this line. Like we want it to tell us to turn to the right and like speed up a little bit or something. We want it to make sure that it's moving from the, the current value to the target value. And then finally the output of the plant then is gonna be our actual mo our actual motion here. So again, to, to recap so far, we're, tr we're using the error between the, the reference value and the target value to try and find a value that we should use as input in order to get the output that moves us closer to the, the, the target value. Okay, so now we have this error, so how do we get this actual, how do we get the output, or the rather the input to the system that we want? Um, so this brings us to the proportional, integral, and derivative terms. Basically, we're taking the error and we're, if, uh, we're looking at like the, the current error, the integral of the error, and the derivative of the error. So what does that mean? Okay, so let's say that for the sake of these three graphs, our like current or like target value is um, is the white line, and then our our current value is the the red line, and our referenced value is the white line. Um, how do I hide this? Okay, that's annoying. Um, but yeah, okay. So our current value is going to be the 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 red line and the left are proportional, and then we're trying to get to the white line. So for, for proportional, it just takes the immediate error between the two. This would be like the lateral distance between the robot's path that it's currently on and the distance that it's trying to follow. And it's just an instant moment in time, it just takes that error. Um, the integral error takes the integral of the error over time. So it takes the sum of all of the errors that um, or between the current uh, value and the reference value. Now these can be positive and they can also be negative. Um, and so as you can see here, like initially um, for, for this like current value compared to the reference value, we our integral term in pink here oops, um, starts rising as we have a positive integral. And then at some point we uh, overshoot and go past our, tar our reference, our target value. And then now the integral starts to decrease as it takes off some of this negative, um, negative integral. Um, and then the third, third type is the derivative error. So we're taking, we have the error, or we have like our current value in red again, moving towards our reference value in white, and we take the derivative at each time step. Um, and this kind of gives us a measure of how quickly we're approaching the reference value. Um, so 
like you can see if we're going really close, you know, then we have a very large negative derivative value. Um, and basically these three things help give us a way to look at the current error, the error that we have over time, and how quickly we're approaching the reference uh, or like the target value. So the way these get combined is you, you uh, end up adding them. And so we add the error again of the current time, we add the error over time, and then we add the error as like basically kind of what we expect to happen. So um, as we're going to be moving towards that value. And um, it, the way that we balance those three things out, because obviously they're on different, like somewhat different scales of error, um, is that we, uh, we use a gain, uh, which is like a multiplier on each of those three terms. So um, we would apply like a, a weighted average, or no, a weighted sum rather, of these three terms. Um, and so effectively the proportional term just tells us which direction to move, um, or like which way to move just to get directly to the reference value. The integral value tells us that um, if we've been accumulating error, then we should move towards the reference value. Um, and then the derivative tells us that if we're moving really fast towards the error, we should maybe slow down. So, um, before I go on, what questions does anyone have? Is there a uh, good process for figuring out those different gains? Or is it just trial and error? I am so glad you asked. Um, that is our next question. Uh, so how do we figure out those gains? Well, we, it's a process called tuning. Now, there are, there are some processes that uh, like people have come up with to sort of optimally like try to tune these values for certain things. Um, that's where like taking classes is, and there, there's a whole fields of control theory that are built on how you can come up with these optimal, um, the optimal P, I, and D gains. But in practice, uh, you usually just sort of do them by hand and there's some tips and tricks that we will get into in a second about how you can go about tuning them. Uh, does anyone have any other questions on um, just like proportional integral and derivative error in general? Okay, great. Um, all right, so then the things that we're trying to basically tune for is, is we again, we want to go from our like process variable, our current value, to the reference value, which is commonly called the set point. And what we want to do is we want to um, make this value just go like ideally um, we would go straight to that set point and then just stay there but of course um, like things aren't perfect and um, like if you know if we're going like you can imagine if we're driving towards this line like again if this is our robot we're driving towards this this uh, path here but you know we're still facing that way and then we're going to overshoot a little bit we're going to cross over the ref the set point that we're trying to go to and then eventually you kind of can correct over time, um, but you have what, these oscillations in the in the signal. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize those oscillations and also drive the process variable to the set point as fast as we possibly can. Um, and so we're doing that by controlling the gains on p on p i and d gains. So what do what does this kind of look like? So here's like an example of some. Um, like controller responses that you could have. So what we have initially is that um, both the squiggly line, that's the like process variable, and the set and set point are both at maybe zero. And then the set point is a, it's called a step response, where it basically makes a step. It just goes straight from one value to another. Um, so what we see in this first upper left one is that the process variable variable is oscillating a lot and it has a large overshoot. In other words, it shoots past the set point by a lot. And then it continues to oscillate. Um, and so, if we uh, turn like turn down the well, okay. So, so why why would it be overshooting, and how can we use the gains to to prevent that? Um, so, if we remember from our slide here, um, when we are kind of far away from the reference value um, uh, initially, there's there's not much integral error because uh, 
when you start off, there's not much time left to build up the error. However, the proportional gain is really high um, because you're very far away from the reference value. Similarly, the derivative uh, initially um, is, is almost zero. So you're not going to be um, like moving super quickly, although in a minute you will be because the proportional gain is like dominating the controller response. So in this case, we're kind of far away. And so then the proportional gain basically says, hey, we need to quickly move back to here because there were a far distance between our current value and our set point. Um, so if we turn that down a little bit and we, we lower that um, proportional gain, then now we can have um, a little bit uh, less of that oscillation. Um, and then you can kind of continue to turn it down a little bit more um, and uh, decrease the oscillations that you see. Um, so another thing to be uh, aware of is that the time during the time that it takes for the the value that you're initially at to to reach that set point, no matter how uh, how like with my, how many oscillations you take, the amount of time it takes, like there's going to be error. Um, how can I explain this? There's going to be error accumulating during the time that it takes to get to the actual set point because of the integral term. Again, the integral is like effectively accumulating the error over time. So um, if the uh, I gain, the, the integral gain is somewhat high, then you can continue to see these oscillations um, even though you're, you're lowering your, your, your proportional gain. Um, and so um, if you, you sometimes have to lower the integral gain in order to prevent having some overshoot. So the, integral, so the integral gain can also lead to overshoot as well if your controller doesn't respond fast enough to reaching the set point. Um, what we're looking for is like what would be like perfect is uh, this controller right here where it, it starts at the original value and then pretty quickly moves to the uh, set point. Um, this would be an example of one that moves a little bit too slow. So it doesn't, it, it moves towards there and it doesn't overshoot at all, but it, you know, maybe we can go a little bit faster. We might want our system to respond to the set point and control it as fast as we can. Um, the derivative gain, again, is, is controlling how quickly, um, or is like looking at how quickly the error is changing. Um, it's the derivative of the error over time, how fast it's changing over time. And so for this upper left controller where we move very quickly towards the set point, we have a very, we'd have a very high derivative. So in, in this case, it's a proportional integral con controller, so it's not actually using a derivative gain. We'll see what the effect of the derivative gain is in a second. Um, but basically, it, if the derivative gain is, is really high, then uh, we, we limit how fast the controller can move towards the set point. And effectively, this, this basically tries to say, hey, if I see that you're moving too fast towards the set point, then we're going to decrease it a little bit so that maybe we don't um, have as much overshoot. So um, let's recap generally what do these P, I, and D gains or gains do and like what do they contribute to? So the proportional one is generally the one that you want to like mess with first because it's, it's, it's controlling like how it's, it's a measure of it's, it's acting on how far away you are from the set point. Um, the integral gain can um, help like eliminate some steady state error, which I guess steady state is when the system like is eventually just flatlining. If, if for some reason it's not close to the set point, eventually the error, error will accumulate and then the integral term will pull it back down to the set point. Um, but you have to be careful because if your system is too slow, the integral term can also uh, contribute to overshoot, and then you might have to lower it. And then again, the derivative gain um, tries to decrease overshoot, um, but we'll see how it can be a problem in a minute because these aren't good examples here. Um, at a glance, this is effectively what the, the, the PID control algorithm is. So we start off with our set point, and then we take our current output value, our current our current um, like value, and then we can the process variable from here, if you will, and then we compare those two, and we get an error, and then we feed that to the P, I, and D uh, 
blocks. So for the proportional gain, um, the P part, we are multiplying it, the gain just by the error itself. That's just the, the moment in time, we're just using a gain to represent um, how much we want to pay attention to that value. Um, and we pass that away. The integral one, again, is taking a derivative of that error over the, um, over the time. And in practice, um, you just end up like, like just summing up the error as you go. And then the derivative gain, uh, I'll move my cursor here, is uh, taking that derivative to try and find how fast the error is changing over time. And so then those gains control how much you pay attention to each one of those terms. And then those all get summed together and then use as input into the process for um, making whatever controller decision you're making. In our robot example, um, this would be like the decision to maybe like turn or to speed up or something like that. Um, yeah, so I, I, a concrete example would be our um, the controller for our India Autonomous Simulator. Um, we ended up not, I don't know what we ended up, we ended up using something, but um, the design for the Pure Pursuit controller was a PID uh, velocity controller where we are just comparing the current velocity to the velocity that the target velocity and then tuning these values to get our um, acceleration. And one thing to note is that um, the whole thing is uh, like dependent on the units of the input and output. Um, so like the set point that is that you're trying to get to and your current value should be the same units. Um, but depending on how you're using it with your process, they also don't have to be, because you're just effectively calculating the error and then using that in your control scheme. Okay, so what questions do uh, does anyone have on on this slide, on how to how to tune them and use the gains to to uh, pay more attention to certain parts of the error? All right, no questions. I guess that's good. Um, okay, so let me ask you this. If, if our controller looked like this if, in the picture in the lower right, um, what tuning change might we want to make? Would we want to mess with the, the P gain, the I gain, or the D gain? I'm going to guess the P gain, Alex. OK. And why is that? So for the bottom right one, correct? Yeah. So wouldn't the P gain make it increase a bit faster? So it's sort of like petering off after a little bit there without actually reaching to the target value. Yeah. Yep. OK. Yeah, exactly. That's what I would do, too. Uh, what, if our, what if our controller looked like this in the lower left? What do we? What should we do? What could we do? Uh, I would increase the D gain so that it doesn't overshoot as much. Okay. Sure. Yeah, we could do that. One thing that's important to to realize is that there's a lot of different ways that you could like, like the like the the p i and d values are not are not necessarily unique for it. So there's a lot of different like like um, options you could you could try to tune it. Okay, so so the d gain might work there. What uh, what else might work there? So we have some overshoot. It's like going pat. It's going too far past the set point. So 
So what would happen if we increase the P gain with the one in the lower left? Would that make it go up faster? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we might that might make us go back up to like this graph where we increase the gain and it, now we're overshooting by more. So maybe we decrease the P gain um, and then that might give us a better response. Maybe that would track close to the system. But maybe we have a pretty low P gain um, and like we now have like a slower system. So it's it's like the the p gain is is going towards it and it's not overshooting by as much we still we still have this overshoot so one thing to be aware of here um is, is that like while it's moving towards set point it's also still accumulating error and so um that could be from the i gain where uh at, even though you decrease the the p gain and you think it should be good to go to the set point the i gain is contributing to the error because it's adding on top of the the um, like the process input um, and causing us to have a little bit of overshoot. So the eye gain, even even though it can be helpful for um, times when you're at steady state and you're not close to the set point, um, it can also potentially increase offset or increase your overshoot. Um, and in practice, you, by the way, usually the the p gain is the largest, the eye gain is um, is relatively small, and the d gain is um, very small um, or not used at all. Um, and does anyone can does anyone know like why the D gain might be problematic in practice? And after this one, then we'll go to the demo. Well, if you use too much, uh, it might start looking like the bottom right one where you never actually reach the true value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and so like maybe how do we how do we. This value that we're seeing here um, is the the value that we think the system is at. Right. So how, how are we measuring that? Uh, that value. For example, um, if we had our robot, we're, we're trying to measure or we're trying to measure our error between um, the the path that you're currently on and the path that you're trying to be on. But how do you how do you know what the error is? What are you using to measure the error? OK, well, we might use some kind of sensor like we might be like um, like like using using some sort of sensor that's that's going to be measuring that for us. But the sensor itself is not necessarily perfect. So um, what if there's noise in the sensor measurement? Uh, if there's a little bit of noise, it's going to be pretty close to our actual position. And then we'll know that our have a good measure of, of where we are. But if there's a lot of noise in our system, then if there's a lot of noise in our sensor, then we might be, it might seem like we're jumping around like this, even though the robot might not actually be like moving around the current path it's on, to the sensor that we're measuring, it might, we might be getting values that make it seem like we're moving very fast, um, crossing over the, the, the set point, or at least um, click approaching and moving away from the reference value. Um, so, uh, So as the derivative value gets really steep and moves far and away from the set point, 
then the um, the error there gets very large because the derivative is effectively like measuring that change in error. And if you have a lot of if you have a lot of a noise, you're gonna even if you're far away from your re reference point, you might it might be um, shaking a lot um, as it could make, making your system think that it's going to be suddenly jumping towards the set point, but really it's not. And one thing that um, can be tricky is that uh, that that noise can be really hard to see, and it can actually be like on a very small scale. So even though your line, even though your line might look smooth, if you zoom it in a lot, you might see a lot of noise there. And that derivative term doesn't care. It's just looking at the the immediate change in error. Um, there's other tricks you can play on it to make it not care as much, but um, on its own, it's going to uh, be sensitive to the amount of noise in your sensor. And since there are sensors and noise in a lot of sensors, um, that's why like often usually in practice the d term is not really used but it's still good to be aware of of what it does cool all right so let's jump to the let's jump to our little demo here um okay can't see my there we go all right so this is a oops let me go back here quick um so this is a uh just a file that i'll put in our github that you can run later but basically when we load it up, we see here our set point in orange, and then the green is the current state, and then blue is the controller output. Um, and so basically, like, as we go from our current state towards the set point, our controller output is going to be going to zero, and then we're effectively not going to be having any kind of any kind of output. All right. So what do we see here? Um, we've got our set point slider. At the bottom, that controls where the set point is, and then sliders for our p, i, and d gains. And then this is all updating live um, to whatever these values are set to in the sliders. Um, we also have some optimal values here that are kind of tuned already ahead of time, so that we just have an idea of like what the answer key is basically. But what do we see here? We see that we're we're moving like relatively slowly towards the um, towards the the set point. And then um, starting to overshoot a little bit. So um, let's go back here and let's try to decrease the proportional gain. So maybe we're maybe we're like increasing too fast. Um, so again, we're seeing that we're kind of moving towards it, and then we're going to be overshooting. Um, so let's try. Uh, we can try decreasing the p gain and um and see if that how that helps us or doesn't help us um so if we change our set point here um like this all right so it kind of worked oh but actually we're still we're still overshooting past the set point um and then it, see if we, if we decrease it now we would expect to be jumping down and, and there we go but we're not really moving very fast towards the set point. So this would maybe make us think that we want to increase the P gain. All right, so, so let's, um, let's do that. But before we do, I guess, we also see that we're, we're also overshooting um, by a good amount. And well, as we saw before, when the, the P gain was pretty low, we're still overshooting. It could be because the P gain is so low, it's taking a long time to get us there and the air is accumulating and the I gain, the integral, is accumulating a lot of error. Um, so let's let's run. I'm just restarting it because it's like kind of slow on my computer. Um, it should be faster on uh, Windows or Linux, but it's playing some backend tricks to get to work on Mac. Anyway, um, so let's try let's try decreasing the I gain. So we'll just decrease that um, to our the kind of the known value. But you can play around with it and whatever you want to see how it affects it. All right, um, so now we've got our eye gain set. Um, and if we go ahead and increase our, uh, our set point and move it around, um, we still kind of see that we're not moving as fast as we would like to be moving towards the, um, towards the value. However, we're not really like overshooting quite as much anymore. So that's good. Um, let's increase the let's increase the p gain a little bit. All right, so we're gonna increase that a little bit here. So now we're a little bit better tuned. We're able to 
track the set point a little bit better. Um, bring it up. You see, all right, now we're moving towards it. Um, and it seems like we're kind of reaching the, the value pretty well. So we're overshooting a little bit, but not, not too much. Um, but there's a lot of jagged movement in how we're going towards the set point. And that's not really what we want because um, we can see that our, our uh, control output is also very jagged. Um, and so like that would basically be like jerking the controller around. If this were if this were controlling the steering on our car, it'd basically be like like moving the steering like a lot and then back to zero and a lot a little bit less and a little bit less and kind of keep going back and forth, back and forth. And it would look really jerky instead of being nice and smooth like we would want it to be. Um, so uh, let's de. So basically, like um, we're moving towards the value. The D gain is controlling is reacting to how fast we're moving towards the set point. And because we're moving like kind of fast or faster towards it, um, it's trying to jerk us back away from the set point. Um, and it's doing that at kind of each each step here. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and decrease our D gain a little bit, um, and and see how that changes things. All right, we'll try to increase our set point again. Uh, computer is really slow, but okay, great. So now we're now we're we are much smoother moving towards our uh, set point, and we can see that it's reflected in the control output too. That it's also a, a lot smoother. We go up, and then we kind of gradually. Um, adjust our control so that we don't uh, jerk the, the output around. Um, and uh, we can go ahead and just set the, the D gain to zero. Um, see what that does. And we know that it's we know that it's good for this, but um, we can just kind of see what the effect of that is. So if we move our set point around, we see that okay, like we're like we move towards we move towards the target value, but we don't move super um, like like way too fast. We don't have a lot of overshoot. So I mean, I think it's a reasonable assumption that we can like not we can get away with not having the derivative term in there anymore. Um, and so now we kind of see we can see sort of how fast um, we're tracking on to the set point, and um, it's good. But you know, could it could it be a little bit better? Um, like for example, if, if our set point was was changing quickly, um, we might not be able to keep up with it. Uh, all right. So to try and to try and track the, the set point a little bit faster, uh, let's increase the p gain. And um, I guess we know what the value should be. In practice, you'd kind of try like a range of values. Um, but you sort of just keep trying things and sort of observing the, observing the behavior. And so now um, we have what we think are like reasonable parameters for our P, I, and D gains in our controller. And then we can just do some last tests here to look at, um, look at the controller response to these different step inputs. And so, what we see there is that we're tracking down to to these uh, to the value um, quite a bit faster, and um, having a p gain is also especially important when like the set point change might not be super large, but you still want to move because the error, the immediate error is going to be maybe small, but you still want to be able to respond um, to that to that error and move to the set point like relatively quickly. Um, you don't want to have to only have large errors. So um, now we have our, our now we have our controller tuned, and we think we're ready to go. So one thing that we have to be really careful about is that this has been tuned to certain levels of input error. In other words, the these step changes that we've been making have only been within like the zero to two hundred range. Um, if we all of a sudden, or if our controller all of a sudden encounters an error of say like five hundred. Um, it's gonna think that it like it's gonna move a lot, but it's it's not gonna um, maybe move in a way that we'd want it to move. So depending on like how large the error is for what the controller is tuned for, um, 
it might not have a good response. And in this case, it does just because um, I already kind of limited it to 200 so that I like knew it would be OK. Um, but you know, you get the idea that if, if there's a large amount of error that you're not, the controller's not used to seeing, um, then you might have a like output that you're not expecting, and you might have the controller um, overreact or underreact to that level of error. Um, and so it, the takeaway is that the controller is tuned um, within a certain range. Effectively, um, it's being tuned to a certain level of error that it's expect, like a certain range of error, and um, for example, we might tune the controller to have PI and D gains for following the vo maintaining a velocity at like 10 miles an hour. But now if we want to maintain the velocity at like 80 miles an hour, uh, we might have to retune those gains. And um, a lot of times what's done in practice is you, you tune the gains ahead of time so that like once your range changes, then you just automatically switch the gains of your controller. So you might like tune the gains to 10 miles an hour first um, and then do a separate test where you're tuning the gains to 80 miles an hour so that then when you um, know that you're trying to transition from 10 to 80 miles an hour um, then you adjust your gains accordingly and then hopefully you're able to maintain maintain control of the system and you're able to move your current state to the set point um, quickly without overshooting and um, with have a so you can still have a smooth control output that um, that basically like reduces the vibrations of the system and um, keeps everything nice and nice and smooth. All right, so that is that is the demo, and we'll put this file in the um, in the GitHub. And if you if you want to, um, you should be able to just run it, um, and then this screen will pop up. Uh, if you're on Mac, I'll direct you to the links you need to follow to set up the back end. There's some fine points of that. But if you're on Windows or Linux, it should just work immediately. Um, and yeah, then you can just use this to play around, try different set points, um, try different gains, set them to zero, set them to the full range, whatever you want. Um, just play around, and, and hopefully, this helps build some intuition around how to go about tuning a PID controller. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Any other questions uh, about it? Okay, great. Well, if there are any other questions in the future, um, definitely feel free to ask me or anyone else on the anyone else on the team. I'm more than happy to help. And um, uh, a lot of the tuning for this stuff just comes with experience and um, just like, like experimenting around. Usually, you try to do as much as you can in simulation, and then in practice, you would have like something that where you could like manually adjust the uh, adjust the the gains like here as you're working with the system, so you can see. How uh, the um, what your how how the gains are affecting the system as you're using it. There are also some ways to like optimally tune the uh, find these gains, and those might work at least as a good starting point. Um, but sometimes you'll have to do a little bit of hand tuning as well. All right, so we'll wrap this up then, um, and I will stop sharing here. If I can figure out how. There we go. All right, how long did that take? Um, this is probably a little bit longer on a longer end of the brown bags, but.
Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Alex. Um, are we are we good for the meeting for today then? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Um, just a note, Alex, I recorded that um, and I'm stopping it now.